everybody excited to be here? Yeah. <laughs> what a good turnout. Chris and I were just joking, we're like, sex sells. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so we're so happy to have Dr. Wendy Walsh here today, and I know you guys have been bombarded with emails as reminders of why Wendy is here, but just to give you guys some background on her, um, she's America's thought leader on relationships, and each week on CNN and the O'Reilly Factor, she breaks down the psychology of sex, love, gender roles, divorce, parenting, and other human behaviors. As host of Investigation Discovery Network's Happily Never After, she guides viewers through the sometimes treacherous sides of love. As resident expert at datingadvice.com, no subject is taboo in her popular advice column. And as former co-host of The Doctor's TV show, if you guys haven't seen it, definitely check her out on YouTube, <laughs> she was nominated for a 2012 Daytime Emmy Award, and she also um, lectures on evolutionary psychology and human mating strategies at California State University Channel Islands. She holds a BA in journalism, a master's degree in psychology, and a PhD in clinical psychology. She has authored The Boyfriend Test, The Girlfriend Test, and The 30 Day Love Detox. Thank you. Wow. So I don't think, I don't need to use a microphone, right? I just want to, you guys can hear me all okay? Yeah? OK, it seems a little more intimate that way. Um, if you hear anything that you want to tweet, I'd be really, really thrilled if you would tweet it today. It's at Dr. Wendy Walsh. Um, the reason why I called my lecture The Economy of Sex is because it's a very provocative type, title, and people immediately think of prostitution. But it has nothing to do with that, actually. It has to do with the fact that anthropologically, we are here to reproduce, right? And we have a survival mechanism to reproduce. And the big currency for reproduction, of course, is obtaining a mate who will uh, give you offspring that will survive into the next level. So that's why I call it about the economy of sex. And I really loved that slide, by the way, because how many people have ever sat on a date and watched somebody eat their money. Um, OK, let's start off with a fun little fun fact quiz. If you had to guess, what percentage of American men aged 18 to 25, this was a young person study, um, can obtain sex on a first date? They have such an A game. Uh, why don't you just think the number in your head for now, and then we'll go over them. Uh, what percentage of men in our culture are considered players? And here's how this study defined players. They've had at least three sexual partners a year for three consecutive years. That's at least nine partners in three years. That's considered a Don Juan. Number of hookups the typical college student has each year. Think about it. Think about it. Uh, percentage of college students who are virgins. And the number of lifetime sexual partners. Now, I don't want any men to talk, because men always know the correct answers to this. I will tell you that. <laughs> women are the ones. That women, men know the numbers so well. OK, so I only want to hear from women. How many men age 18 to 25, if 100 of them go out on a first date with a new woman tonight, what percentage are going to obtain sex? 60, 25. 60, 25. What else I got? 30? No men talk yet. OK. Guy, give me something. 2%. There we go. OK. <laughs> It's actually just under 20%. But again, these are young 18 to 25-year-old guys. So it's just under 20%. Uh, I'm sorry? Just under 20%. So it's about a 1 in 5 chance if you're 18 to 25 and filled with testosterone and you've honed your A game as much as possible. But the point here is men, women are ingesting this idea that sex is happens all the time to everybody, and they're the ones that should be complying. All right, percentage of men who are players. They've had at least three partners a year. Let's start with women. These guys have had three partners a year for three consecutive years. Women, ha what percentage of our male population? This, this study was older. These were men 18 to 30. 25 percent. 65, 50? Come on, anybody else? 40? OK, I want a man to answer. 10. That's pretty generous. It's 3%. Wow. Three, now remember, you guys are living in LA and New York. It's a whole different world in LA and New York, right? <laughs> OK, number of hookups the typical college student has every year. Oh, a hookup is a full on, good. Full, that's a, that is the big question, actually, because people use the term so loosely, and they may mean that they just met for coffee. Um, but the truth is, a hookup is a sexual encounter with no strings attached and no expectation of ever seeing the person again. Five a year per college student? One. One. Three, yeah. 
Okay, the one is right on. Uh, the average college student has about one a year. However, that's the average. The, the right, that's the average, right. The, the study showed that when asked, in the same study, when they asked people, what do you think the typical college student has, not me, them, um, they found that they said about 80% 80, 80 of the typical students have at least two or more per year. When act, that's the belief system. But when they actually asked people had they have hookups, and they found out that only 35% of the students had only one hookup in the last year, and the rest had none. Uh, percentage of college students who are virgins in 2013. Yes, men or women, huh? It's 25%, okay, 25%. Human beings begin having sexual activity usually somewhere between the ages of 16 and 25, and it's a big range. And the higher one is educated, the longer they delay the onset of sexual activity because they tend to put career. Oh, and by the way, religion is name number three as why these college students choose virginity. Number one is uh, STD, pregnancy, my, and then the other is uh, derailing their career and education plans, and then three is religion. I'm gonna save the number of lifetime sexual partners until we get to the end of this lecture, but I wanna say quickly, what I'm hearing from you is that you guys are believing the media mythology that everybody is hooking, especially the women, that everybody's hooking up everywhere all the time. And that's actually not the reality of what's going on. Okay, what we're in right now is what I call a high supply sexual economy. And it's actually related to the rise of women. Now, I'm not blaming women here. I just want you to understand that when women rise in power, sex rises in supply in our culture. Now, we know what happens when women are disadvantaged. We have enough examples of that around the world, enough examples in history. When women are disadvantaged and they cannot extract resources from the environment, they basically have to monetize their pussies. I'm sorry, we can't put that on YouTube, can we? Uh, <laughs> so either they withhold sex, wait till a guy signs on the dotted line to support them and their offspring in a contract called love and marriage, right, here. They don't have a choice, by the way. It's not a choice. When you don't have the ability to uh, extract resources, get a job, gainful employment, the only thing you can hope to do is hook up to a guy who will support you and your kids. And in order to do that, virginity is coveted. We know that in cultures where women are disadvantaged, marriage rates go up, more children are born into wedlock, uh, virginity is coveted, and oh yeah, prostitution goes way up. Um, I used an old fashioned prostitute there because the height of prostitution worldwide was probably Victorian England, the most repressed time for women. So that and it was a very, it was a time of great economic expansion when the middle class was developing in England, but it was only a time of economic prosperity for men. So women had a choice, not even reveal an ankle, or God forbid they couldn't get a husband, or sell it. And in Victorian England, uh, it was estimated there, there was one prostitute for every 12 men in the population. That's pretty high. Okay, a lot of competition there. So we know what happens when women are disadvantaged. We know what happens with sexuality. What ha and I want you to think a little bit about what's going on in the sex slave trade in Asia right now. Think about what's going on in India, China, Thailand, where women are disadvantaged, right? So, and one interesting thing, a modern day twist on it, is that as women are becoming more educated, particularly in India, the call, they're working the call centers, they're becoming doctors, they're retaining their virginity because of cultural pressures. So you've got this population of women who are now working, having education, retaining their virginity, maybe until they're 30, until their wedding day because of the cultural pressures, and you've got this huge population of men, what, 20% of them who get laid on the first day, who can't. So it gives rise to more prostitution. Uh, when we have powerful women that we have right now, what happens is <laughs> we know we know that we're seeing an unprecedented rise of women in America. For every two guys that graduate college, there are three women. Women make up three-fifths of graduate school populations. The only place we're 50-50 are law schools and medical schools. Maybe we're lagging a little bit in engineering, but we're, and the hard sciences, we're catching up fast. So in the aged 22 to 32 population, women are actually making more than their male peers because we are now in a world of information technology. And guess who, who are great communicators? Hmm, we are darn good talkers and good typers. So all of a sudden, women have an equal ability or better even advantage to extract resources from the environment. When women rise, and there are more women in the workforce right now in America. Now a lot of expensive men were laid off during the Great Recession, and we still need a lot more heels and stilettos and skirts in the uh, boardrooms, but uh, they're definitely more women working than men in America right now. 
So what happens is when women have their own economic potential, they don't need marriage necessarily. So they put sex out into the culture in high supply because they can finally just enjoy the pleasures of their body, right? I mean, it sounds good, doesn't it? And, uh, uh, you know, it does. It sounds really good that women can just make their own money and have sex with whoever they want, whenever they want, except three things happen to men in a high supply sexual economy. And this is the first example in history where we've been able to actually look at it. The first is some men lose ambition. Historically, <laughs> hunter-gatherer men competed against other young men to extract resources from the environment so they could impress women. Did you know a hunter-gatherer man could have easily supported his entire village on squirrels? But oh no, he had to go out and risk his life, get a team of boys together, pull back a huge woolly mammoth, because what would he get? He would get access to more women. He could also display waste, because there's no way of refrigerating all that meat, right? So he could say, hey, I'm so big and cool, I can let that meat just rot in the sun, because I know all you ladies will have your pick, and then I'll have your pick of you. By the way, today's woolly mammoth is called a Super Bowl ring. All right, <laughs> same deal. Um, so when women are making their own money, there is a small population, maybe 30% maybe of the men, <laughs> no, who can now sit in their mom's basement until they're 30 playing Xbox and ask women to text in naked pictures of themselves. And then they can go over to her condo because she has a perfectly well-suited Martha, Martha Stewart bed and they don't need to do anything. So that's one problem is that we're starting to see, there are a host of books about it. Failure to launch is one of the big ones about young men failing to launch. That's one of the problems in a high supply sexual economy. Some others lose the ability to commit. <laughs> Because there is a group of men who are loving this high supply sex. And they are riding this wave of free sex because, oh, guess what? Men don't have a fertility window. Oh, there is no rush. They can wait until they're in their 40s and they can marry a girl who's in her 20s. Um, or they can leave baby mamas along the way. They've got lots of choice. So it's getting harder and harder for, men, for women to get some men to commit. I say some because they don't all fall. And the other thing that happens is plenty of good guys, remember the other 97% that aren't the players? They feel pressure in a high supply sexual economy to act like players. So you end up not being authentic with who you are. TV, are they players? What? That's New Kids on the Block. That is New Kids <laughs> on the Block. I, know. I wondered if anybody would recognize that. I just like the picture. OK. So those are the three things that happen to men in a high supply sexual economy. But there are also three things that happen to women in a high supply sexual economy. Uh, some women adopt a male model of sexuality. Um, now, I wanna, this is a good place for me to stop and explain that men and women are biologically a little different. Um, I love that we're really politically correct in our world and we think and we do know that in our workplace we can be as equal to extract resources from the environment. But I have not met a guy yet who can breastfeed. I have not met a guy who can actually grow a baby, and none of you have fertility windows. So when you hear me talk about the differences, don't think political incorrectness. Think of, I'm thinking about the biological reality of what's going on. So let's talk about sexuality. Um, men and women have sex for different reasons and in different ways. Women, not all women, okay, don't jump on me, can fall in love through sex because their body excretes large amounts of oxytocin, the female bonding hormone. And there are only two times in a woman's life where her body excretes a lot of oxytocin. It is during breastfeeding so that she can have a bonding experience with her baby and it is during female orgasm. So there are plenty of women out there because of our high supply sexual economy and our permissiveness and our media telling you that everybody's hooking up who start hooking up and then start going, whoa, this doesn't really feel good. But, or they call me and say, why hasn't he called me back? And I'm like, but you said that was just sports sex. Why do you care if he calls you back? But I don't know, he should still call me back, right? So their body's bonding and they're not even aware of it. Now, men can also fall in love, not necessarily through sex, but if they are in love with someone, they can have much better sex, okay? But a man can also have sex with the same woman every week for six months and not like her one bit more than he did that first date. Because men biologically can separate sex and feelings a little easier than women can. Now, now, we are seeing a group of women who are able to disassociate and disconnect from their biology. We also see high school students give birth in the stall of their prom and didn't know they were pregnant. Okay, so uh, people, people can't separate from their bodies. Now, the other thing that happens is in a high supply sexual economy is all these super educated, powerful women start to look at their male peers who may not be doing as well and say to themselves, well, I'm going to wait to the CEO because, you know, I've got an MBA and I'm making $240,000 a year. Why should I be dating a, my buddy from the block who's working blue collar somewhere? 
So what happens is you see this population of women who are holding out for a higher status man. And socio sociologists actually call it the George Clooney effect. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so we are seeing this population of women who, um, there, there are some behaving like men. There are some saying, I'll settle down when I feel like it, because I know there'll be a greater guy. But remember, there's one population of peer men who are in their mom's basement. There's another population of peer men who are not committing anytime soon, all right? So this is sort of a message. The numbers don't work. The numbers don't work out. You can, they're losing out, because number three is, many women are losing the freedom to be mothers. This is the new feminist crisis of our generation, and it is this. One in five women are losing the freedom to be mothers because either their fertility window closes before they can get a guy to settle down or because they believe the marketing mythology of the fertility clinics. In vitro fertilization has not improved since the 1980s. Its efficacy is about the same. It's about 15% success rate. The average cost, I did a little bit of research, is $13,700. So for your $13,700, you have an 85% chance of failing with in vitro. But every time a celebrity goes on the news and says that they bought a baby or grew an egg or bought an egg or froze an egg, everyone gets excited. Egg freezing, don't even get me started about egg freezing. We have not even thought out those suckers enough to know what's going to happen. You think autism was the big diagnosis of our generation? Wait till you see kindergarten classrooms filled with thought out eggs. All right? And they are taking $20,000 of women's hard earned after tax money to freeze their eggs. There's lots of solutions, yeah. But you have to do it before you're 35. The height of female fertility. Anybody know? <laughs> yeah. Isn't what they're losing the choice to be mothers, not necessarily freedom? I mean, to your point earlier, they're consciously choosing. Well, they think they're choosing, but they're not being given the full picture. They're being given, they're given the marketing of the fertility clinics that they can wait. The, the, so many young women think they can have a baby until they're 50. Quick question, what do you think the height, the biological height of female fertility is? 32. 25. That's a great example. Okay, yeah, you're closer. It's 20. It's 20. The height. No, the height. I'm sorry, the height. The best it gets. You fall, it, you know, it, it takes a big decline at 30, falls off a cliff at 35. Okay. That, that's again the average. The, the variety is huge. Yes, there's a huge range. Like, so, some women will lose it at 28, and some women will lose it at 45. So it, you know, one of the know. right. So one of the women I interviewed for my book actually had fertility problems in her late 20s, and uh, had that's you know awful. Because I we know. go for our career, and you know, some of us are choosing. This, out, this is the big question. We're going to get there. <laughs> We're going to get there. Okay. I just want you to understand that when sex changes in price, it, changes, it affects our families, it affects our cultures, it affects everything. Okay, so what happens to both genders in a high supply sexual economy? Many are unknowingly shuttled onto the sexual mass market. And so when I hear you guys talk about these, these ideas that people are having, you know, that, that players are 25 or 60% of men, that um, college students are hooking up everywhere, I know you're ingesting the message of our culture that sex is cheap. And sex is not cheap. A high supply sexual economy creates a myth of sexual freedom. The message it sends to men is take all sex, any sex, <coughs> at any cost. And the cost to men, I've been, I, usually by the way, men don't read relationship books, and I'll love you all if you would read mine, but uh, they do call into radio shows, especially the truckers in the middle of the night, and they, <laughs> they do email me a lot. And I hear from so many men who tell me, you know, I'm actually a good guy. I actually want a girlfriend. I, I actually would be happy to kind of, you know, have a family before I'm too old. But all these girls are so sexually aggressive right now, and I can't get one to stay still long enough. So they're being overlooked by their peers, maybe, because they're not George Clooney. Um, and, the other, and then the, the other thing that happens, the message to women is, have plenty of not too much sex. <laughs> Because we have this thing called the sexual double standard. And I want to explain to you why the sexual double standard is actually hardwired in men. You know, what I tell women all the time is, the good news is the sexual double standard has been completely erased, but only in the minds of women. And it's still very much alive in men. And you can sit there and train and train and train men all you want, but it's a reflex in them as, as 
as hard-grained as our fear of snakes. Did you know, by the way, I do this, I teach some evolutionary psychology at my kids' high school, and I come with a, a bag that I pretend it's moving, it's got stuff in it, and I throw a big, giant, very realistic-looking rubber snake into the room, and the kids scream, and I go, why are you so afraid? And then I take the next thing out, and it's electrical cable. I go, in your lifetime, more people die of electrocution than snake bite ever, but you are hardwired to be afraid of snakes. So you are also hardwired to have a double standard, and here's why. The double standard, by the way, is the, uh, the thing that gives women demerit points for sexual experience and gives men great, exciting uh, credit for se the same sexual experience. So in our hunter-gatherer past, if a man happened to hook up with a promiscuous woman and he spent his time getting those squirrels or woolly mammoths or anything else for that offspring, he would risk giving his, his time, his resources, to and protection to somebody else's offspring. Okay, so just to show you that this fear is very real, in one inobtrusive study in American hospitals, they found out that a full 10% of the babies born do not match the DNA of the doting daddy at bedside. Oh, so women fool around too. Hmm. So, what? Are, are, they know that it's not theirs, but they're their age. Or they may not know. This was an unobtrusive study, yeah. That, why do you think those celebrities run right away for a DNA test whenever, <laughs> whenever they get that bill for the baby? It's the same thing, okay? Whether you're bringing them squirrels or paying an alimony check or a child support check, it's the same thing. Guys want to know. And by the way, guys didn't invent monogamy. This new research came out in the last... I love that more women are getting into anthropology. Apparently, they're signing up for that, too, besides med school. Uh, so it used to always... The belief was that monogamy was invented because women were so frail and fragile during those vulnerable ear, years of pregnancy and nursing that they needed to have the protection of a man. They needed to have his resources brought. OK, first of all, the hunter-gatherer societies that exist on the planet today, the gatherers, primarily women, bring home way more calories than the hunters. The hunters get the glory because that woolly mammoth is big. you know. But if you're just counting nuts, roots, and berries, uh, we're doing just fine without you all. So, but what happened is women moved because we're gatherers. So women were the ones roaming further and further and further. And if a man wanted to be sure that that was his offspring, he better tag on to her and keep going after her, right? So it was actually men who invented monogamy, they're now suggesting, because they wanted to make sure who their offspring were. Uh, the double standards around is probably not going anywhere for another 100,000 years. So that's the problem in the high supply sexual economy, is that women are loving their sexual freedom, but at the same time astutely aware of their count and having conflicted feelings about what's going on. OK, so let's talk about what is natural mating. And some of the pictures that you're going to see here, I'm thrilled to tell you that there are a few hunter-gatherer societies on the planet today. And many of them are being, did you see the, the new stuff from the new tribe they found in Peru in the last week? Oh, go online. Google it. Uh, there's a. Uh, <laughs> Um, so every one of them, there would be 100 people and 300 anthropologists around them? Exactly. <laughs> Actually, you can't go near them because there's a rule in Peru that if you meet any indigenous people, you cannot touch them. You have to go far away. So most of these pictures, maybe not this in particular because they're posing, uh, are taken with long-range telescopes because um, they will die from diseases from us. They're not ready for, to be exposed to our modern city diseases. Um, so. Here's, here's what our families looked like. We lived in a roving encampment of maybe 25 to 35 people, about the size of an average office work group, about the size of an average classroom. These, this is a number that works well for humans. Um, most of the people were related to us. They were biologically related. We lived with aunts, sisters, cousins, mothers. Um, we were protected by our brothers. Probably the longest male-female relationship and the closest one in our history was brothers and sisters. Because think about it, your siblings are with you your whole life. I mean, your parents eventually die off, your mate you meet and stays for the second half of your life, but your siblings are there from the beginning and end. So they tend to be very helpful with keeping anybody who has a biological interest in those offspring help them grow. And in fact, anthropologists are now showing that our increase in intelligence is largely related to this very important family structure, that if a child has Consistent, consistent is the key word, not a new nanny fired every week because you don't like her, okay? Consistent primary attachment figures 
the, a young baby has to learn how to decode different people's ways and expressions when they're preverbal. So that decoding process, while the brain is tripling in size in the first year of life, is actually the big intelligence, explo intelligence explosion of humans. So we lived in these encampments. We really didn't see many non-biologically related people, except, oh yeah, those hunters. The odd hunter, the 3% player, the Don Juan, I mean, he's meant to be in this culture too for a reason. So he would travel a little further with his little pack and trying to look for woolly mammoth, and oh, he'd stumble on our village. And all of a sudden, everyone, all the women would sit up and take notice because there was pheromones that smelled a lot different than their brother. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about how anthropologists decide whether um, a certain primate species is monogamous Promiscuous, promiscuous, or something in between. Um, yeah, this is yeah, very good. It's scrotum size. <laughs> so basically, we look at scrotum size in relation to body weight. So at one end of the scale, you've got the orangutan, big hulking body, teeny little nuts very paternal, very monogamous. At the other end, you've got the chimpanzee. I mean, I don't think you can take a picture of a chimpanzee without showing his balls. They're so big, okay? <laughs> Tiny little fast-moving body, huge, enormous gonads, very promiscuous. So what do you think human beings are? We're somewhere in the middle, because we have it all. We have it all. We have, some people would say, a system of perceived monogamy, or culturally imposed monogamy, or, uh, some natural serial monogamy. In fact, because our life is so long now, most people will see at least two, two very long-term stints of monogamy in their lifespan. I mean, when Till Death Do Us Part was invented, death was pretty imminent. So, <laughs> so we'll probably see long stints of monogamy. But yes, so, so this is why in America today, if we're looking at paternal investment in one's offspring, you are going to see a guy whose only investment in his offspring is one teaspoon of sperm at the one end of the scale. And at the other end of the scale, you're going to see a baby wearing, carpool drying, being softball throwing, doting dad, okay? And everything in between. I happen to live in a neighborhood that's a, a wonderful little, I live in Playa Vista, a little bedroom community, and it's filled with small children and babies, and I would say that at least 30% are stay-at-home dads. And I mean, I don't know if they are working from home offices, it's when the, but they line up those little strollers by the basketball courts in the morning, it's pretty hysterical while they get their game in. Um, I'm like, don't let the ball hit the pink stroller, please. Okay, but I mentioned attachment. You know, my area of interest is an area of psychology called attachment theory. It's the ways human beings attach across a lifespan. And specifically, um, you know, the mass media talks about mother-infant attachment, father-infant attachment, because we know that that is the foundation for healthy personality development. Okay, so what it, and, and it eventually translates into a healthy love relationship in adult life. So a healthy attachment means that you've got caregivers who are responsive to a child's needs, and they help create emotional intelligence, feelings of security. When a baby is not stressing about when mommy's coming back or because their diaper's wet or they're crying because they need food, guess what? They're having this moment of quiet looking out into the world and their brain is growing synapses like crazy as they're able to learn. If a baby lives stressed, not feeling safe, they don't grow as much in intelligence. So attachment is primary. Um, it leads to intellectual intelligence, as I mentioned, less anxiety, depression, personality disorders. I mean, attachment is now being linked to so much stuff that's happening later in life. Um, and more than anything, the thing I care about is that it becomes a blueprint for love that transfers eventually to adult relationships. I, I, this is one of the pictures that was taken last week of this new tribe they found in Peru. They're all over Google right now. They're really great pictures. Um, this is what our biology is wired for, to live near nature. And you know, there's a psychologist in Canada. I'm Canadian, so I love to quote this guy. I think his book is called Last Child in the Woods. And he coined a new diagnosis that he calls nature deficit disorder in children. And they're associating with ADD, ADHD, anxiety issues, et cetera. So we're meant to be surrounded by nature. This is what our biology is wired for. We're meant to be with a very safe, secure group of you know, not more than 30, 35 people. And every once in a while, you get a new hunter. Or you meet with another band of people, 30, 35 people, and you see, oh, that's probably only my third cousin. I think that'd be fine, right? And that's how we made it. This is what we are wired for. But this is what our biology is responding to. Crowded subways, crowded nightclubs, crowded digital worlds. So imagine your biology now 
responding to all these objects, pheromones, cues that you're, you know, a new hunter has walked in or you've, you've ventured on a new place with a new young, but, but our biology is going crazy because actually sex with somebody who you weren't related to was a trace nutrient in our anthropological past. I make the comparison between the slow food movement. You know, sugar, salt, and fat were vital but trace nutrients in our anthropological past. Our smart corporations realize that we have an unsatiated craving for salt, sugar, and fat. So they put it into absolutely everything to make us get addicted. So the slow love movement, which I'm going to be talking to you about, is very much like the slow food movement. Remember, this is what we're wired for. This was taken with a long-range telescope, and this is this new tribe in Peru that I can't pronounce the name of. Um, this is really what we're wired for, and this is what we have. This is what we need, high nutrition relationships that are good for our biology, that are good for our psychology, and more than anything, good for our offspring. Of course, the answer is to charge the highest price for sex, and that price is care and commitment. You know, when I was doing, I was holding a lot of focus groups for my book because I, I pulled up all the research. And by the way, I didn't start out to write a book called The 30 Day Love Detox, Don't Have Sex for 30 Days or You're Going to Break Up. I set out to write a book about love 2.0, love 3.0. I want to pull all the research and see what's going on. And the research spoke to me. And I started pulling in focus groups of, and that's how I met Marty. Thank you very much. Marty was at one of my original focus groups when I was researching my book. I pulled in, I pulled in groups of women, and I just asked them to talk to me about their dating lives and what was going on. And what I discovered is that a lot of women, because we're going back to the beginning now, who believe that we're in this high supply sexual economy where every guy's a player and every woman should comply, are signing up for these low criteria relationships that don't actually suit their biology. A low criteria relationship is one where they text a lot, they meet for dinner and sex every once in a while, their families haven't met, they haven't ever talked about a future, and oh, they forgot to mention sexual exclusivity. So these are the low criteria relationships that are existing today. And they work great for guys, by the way, with no fertility window, and uh, it's not a problem. But to actually take the time. Now here are the myths that I came up with that are really keeping people single. The first is this idea we talked about already, that the hookup culture is everywhere and everybody's doing it. It's not. The media is selling you products using sex and selling you reality shows using lots of hookup sex to get your eyeballs there because this was trace nutrients in our anthropological past. Um, this idea that women have sexual needs. Women's sexuality is very responsive, meaning that women's biology gets geared up when they meet someone they're interested in. All of a sudden, everything gets charged up and they get excited. But when that interest goes away, everything sort of calms down and gets kind of suppressed for a while. Women don't tend to replace their boyfriend with pornography and masturbation. That's a guy thing. Guys do that. Uh, women just sort of, it just goes away. And then they meet someone else they're interested in and it all charges up again. But what I hear a lot of women say today, because again, they've been adopting a male model of sexuality is, well, what about my needs? What about my sexual needs? Well, when you look at the research, plenty of women have sex because they're actually looking to, sometimes they have a desire to be desired. Sometimes they just want closeness and companionship. So they're all, the, you know, the sexual act is something that they will do because they're getting all those other things. So when I hear about what about my sexual needs, I always say, you know, guys are a little different. You know, guys are wired to be a little more like basic plumbing, you know, clean the pipes every once in a while, and every guy's different. Sometimes it's once a day, once a month, twice a week, whatever, everybody's got their thing. They use their girlfriend, they use their hand, they use the porn. Do you know one third of all, con I'm telling you guys this, one third of all content on the internet is porn, right? Which is causing a whole nother problem for guys because again, that's junk food sex. So it's desensitizing them. They're having trouble with real, live, warm-bodied women because it's not a new visual stimulation. What makes long-term monogamy work is a very rich fantasy life. And porn disables your fantasy life because you're being fed new images all the time. OK, this is the one that people always ask me about. Well, what about sexual chemistry? you got to make sure you got that sexual chemistry. Like, somehow winning the husband lottery is what you're trying to do. If you just hit on enough, eventually you'll go, oh, it's perfect. Well, actually, one study of more than 2,000 couples showed that the hotter the sexual chemistry early on, the worse the relationship outcomes. 
the more breakups, the more fighting, because sex is a trick. What it does is your body is overwhelmed with hormones and, um, and your neurotransmitters are on fire with excitement. It's not unlike heroin, in fact. So while you're on this heroin high of dopamine, norepinephrine, you literally are not making decisions about whether this person would be a good partner for you. You're saying they're perfect because I'm orgasming. They're perfect. I'm getting off. It's great. And then when your body starts to get accustomed to the dopamine hits, you go, oh, now who are they again? What was that about? And then you say, well, we just didn't have chemistry, and you move on. Actually, studies of long-term married people and even arranged marriages shows that sexual chemistry is something that's fashioned. It's fashioned out of intimacy, emotional intimacy, where you can actually say, here's who I am. I'm not necessarily part of the hookup culture. I'm part of this, or I like to do this, or I like to do that. But if you don't have emotional intimacy, you can't even talk about it, right? Uh, and the last one, this idea that sex leads to love that I talk about. Sometimes for women, sex does lead to, lo lead to love, but it rarely does for men. Uh, you know what? Men don't fall in love through sex. Men fall in love through trust. And because of the sexual double standard, they don't really trust women who are easy. So it's a crazy catch-22 that women are being forced into. And finally, this idea that promiscuity can be turned off. Do you know how often I hear people say, look, I'm doing this for now, but when I settle down, I'm just going to settle down. I would venture to say that every relationship you have in your life is a training ground for every relationship you're going to have in your future. And the only way to train for monogamy is to abstain or be monogamous, actually, um, because you're, you're setting yourself up for needing more variety of stimuli. So I hope I've been able to explain to you how the slow love movement is a lot like the slow food movement. Um, you know, when Car Carlos Petrini, the chef who started the slow food movement in uh, Italy, when he saw the uh, McDonald's go up near the famous Spanish steps in Rome and finally put his foot down and said, enough. We will return to the family table. We will have slow food. We will make, not have mass produced, high technology food. And started this slow food movement and we've started to see little farmers markets crop up. It, the beginning of that, they all thought we were nuts. They thought we were a bunch of hippies in the 80s and 90s, growing our food and being organic. Well, now what do we know about nutrition? We realize that high-tech, mass-produced food is not what we should be taking into our body. And the same thing with high-tech, mass-produced junk food sex. Um, farmer's market, in my mind, equals the kind of close, emotional, loving, supportive intimacy that we want in our lives. And so, I came up with this idea of slow love. Oh, by the way, my book is called The 30-Day Love Detox because one study I found showed that if you have sex within 30 days of meeting somebody, you've got about a 90% chance of being broken up within one year. If you wait only 31 to 90 days, the stats go to about 25% that you'll still be together. But what does it mean? It means that you're building some kind of friendship, some kind of connection before the onset of the heroin that you're going to do. So slow love is about, <laughs> <laughs> is about purging low nutrition relationships. The other thing I've noticed that people do to satisfy themselves emotionally, while they're in one of those low criteria relationships, the one that's just mostly text-based and meet for dinner and sex, is they keep their self-esteem by having a bunch of other partners online. When I say partners, I mean potential partners. They've got Facebook friends. They've got Twitter. They've kept in touch with their high school sweetheart. They've got maybe their ex. They've got somebody at the office. Part of purging uh, low nutrition relationships includes purging all those digital relationships that are not really bringing you emotional sustenance. Um, OK, and then delaying the onset of sex with a new partner. I could not find any research to show that waiting too long was too long. Also for my book, I interviewed these born-again virgins, um, men and women who decided to opt out of the high supply sexual economy and just say, mm, you know, it's really not for me. I'm going to wait until I find someone. And I also interviewed former virgins who were now married, nursing babies. Uh, one woman was a Harvard MBA Wall Street broker, and she was like, and dressed sexy as anybody else. And I said, ha, I wanted to know, how do you say no? How can you say no? You're looking hot. You're going out on dates with same guys. How can you, when the pressure comes on? And what I heard over and over from women is that when you are so sure inside yourself, men and women, that this is what you want for your health, that it's really easy to say no, because you're not, you're not even pressured that much. But this one 25-year-old uh, MBA virgin, I asked her, so what do you do when a guy says, oh, come on? I'm going to get it from somebody. I might as well get it from you. I mean, you know I'm going to go out there and get it. So come on. You and I, we've been dating for a while. And she said, oh, I love it when they say that. I just say, actually, 
I don't think you can get sex with me from someone else. So the point is she values herself. I know a college student girl who the pressure line from the guy was, I don't think I should have to work for sex. And she said, I'm not sex, I'm Cheryl, right? So um, it's about sort of understanding what's going on and where you fit. The other thing is to make sure that you are brave enough to ask for sexual exclusivity. Isn't it amazing that although, as I say, 20% of men may be able to obtain sex on a first date, 80% of women are smart enough not to expose their eggs in their bloodstream to somebody they wouldn't even give the keys to their apartment to to water their plants while they're out of town, right? So we get into these sexual relationships and plenty of people are afraid to ask for exclusivity when STDs are running rampant in our culture. It's so simple to just ask what, the what are we conversation is so difficult for people to have. And then of course, to make sure you use the F word, which are feelings. How do you feel about this? What's going on? And to practice intellectual commitment. Now, what is intellectual commitment? Love and sex are what happens at the beginning of a relationship. But once all the hormones die down, then it becomes an intellectual commitment. And that's when you want to, you know, I hear people say all the time, well, I want to keep my options open, or I want to just, uh, you know, later I'll be, and I'm just like, no, why don't you make an intellectual commitment? like you do in an exercise program, to a diet. See what happens, see what you learn, even if you're just practicing emotional intimacy. Because here's why. It's very well researched. Bonded, Long-term monogamous bonded people actually have higher <laughs> life expectancies. They live longer. Um, the, um, do you know, do you know Dan Buettner's work, uh, The Blue Zones? Anybody read The Blue Zones? It's these five areas on the planet they call Blue Zones where a disproportionate amount of people live to be over the age of 100. And then um, he looks for commonalities between these five areas. And uh, long-term married partners is, you know, none, none of the men over 100 have been playboys. <laughs> they have like one wife taking care of them. <laughs> Actually, monogamy benefits, <laughs> health-wise, monogamy benefits men more than women, believe it or not. Women's health goes down just a little bit because they're doing double duty. Uh, men tend to have much better health if they're in a relationship. Uh, Long-term married people, of course, accumulate more wealth. Do you know how expensive divorce is? Or maintaining two houses with a baby mama and a bunch of kids, or ooh, two baby mamas, yeah. Uh, putting it all in one big pot and planning for the future. Um, their offspring do a whole lot better. I always say this to young men when I see them out at parties and stuff. I go, okay, here's a little quiz for you. If your choice tonight is to hook up with five women and hope that you know, three of them have your babies and you never see them again, or you find one woman and you know, stay with her for 20 years and have two kids and put them through college, where are your genes gonna be in five generations from now? Are your genes going to stay in evolution's chain? I think this is the better way. Uh, OK, let's talk about that. I'll close it with by the numbers. Average lifetime number of sexual partners by gender. This is a new study for, for Centers for Disease Control that came out in 2009. Now, here's what you should know. This must be mean. I'm sorry? The mean has to be equal. The mean, that, I mean, except for homosexual. No, here's why. <laughs> they, I love having bright people in the room. Uh, <laughs> even on anonymous sexual surveys, men lie up and women lie down. Oh, so these are lies. These aren't actual reported. These are reported. OK, so what this is, yeah, so, that, so we can assume that the average, so your mean answer is five, right? <laughs> it's probably five. Um, this is a Centers for Disease Control study of more than 6,000 people. And this is age 18 to 44. So it's not over middle age, doesn't, is not encompassed there. And by the way, anything I've talked about today, um, please contact, feel free to contact me. I've got all the references in the studies if you want to look into them a little further. And they're all in my reference section of my book, too. I think some of you are going to get a copy of the book. Um, OK, so now I want you to understand, if the mean is five, the number of people who've had sex with more than 15 people is 27% men and 10% women. Again, men lie up and brag, women lie down. So I don't know, maybe it's 15, 17, yeah. So that's also pulling that number, that six and four, 20, that still brings in that 27% of men who have 15 or more. So even to say that the average lifetime partners is five for men, it's even a little high. Um, That's a good point. But in general, the way our culture is, men tend to over. Yeah, but you're, you're right. So you're saying once they hit a certain point, yeah. even they know that culturally having 300 partners is not cool. Right. So, they, <laughs> <laughs> so they'll start to take it to 30, right? <laughs> um, but my favorite study is the number of men who would prefer a romantic date over a hookup is 75%. Women are always surprised by this number. Is there any man in this room who can help 
explain to the women why this number is this number. Is there any man who would prefer a romantic date to a hookup in this room? One is very And so a romantic date could lead to <laughs> consist, well, consistent frequent sex. It also could lead to all the other things, a relationship. Oh, God forbid. It could actually lead to all the social support that you need, that accumulation of wealth and better health and everything else. So even men like romance and like slow love. But women feel that somehow, in fact, when, women, when that population of women who have adopted the male model of sexuality, they're actually not adopting a male model of sexuality. They're adopting the three percenter because that's what they know. That's been the most obvious to them. So if you love better, you can actually live better. And there's all my contact. And let's start with some questions. <laughs> Thanks so much for this talk. It was You're very, welcome. very interesting. Thanks, Marty, for putting this together. I had two, one question, one comment, and one question. Yeah. Uh, my comment is, I used to teach sex health in college, and I feel like so many students would benefit from seeing these numbers when they first enter into college because, as you said, you know, media is totally off. And I grew up watching Friends before going to college, and I was like, oh, everybody's just in bed with each other all the time. <laughs> so um, I, 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 I actually have an answer of how you all can help me with that. Um, Marty very kindly has a camera here for a reason. Um, I'm going to use part of this as an audition tape for NACA, National Association of Campus Activities, to audition to get on the college circuit. So um, I, will, I should put a link of where, if you, anyone emails me any quote about this talk that's positive, I'll put it on my flyer. Yeah, I'll put anything you can give me positive, and you're always welcome to go and refer me for a TED talk, just saying. Uh, okay, it's online, you just fill it in. <laughs> go ahead, what's your question? Um, and then another thing, you refer to con like um, the whole economic background of this, and I mean, I definitely think, believe it's an exchange, and there's lots of, you know, sex economics going on, but I think a major part of economics is understanding the marginal utilities and like being open about your functions. So I feel like, I mean, everybody might not be within these numbers or these ranges or anything like that, but I think a very important thing along with slow love is just open and honest love, like from the beginning. Exactly. What you're looking for, what you want. I mean, sometimes the men want something that traditionally a woman would want, sometimes a woman mm -hmm. just wants something. Yeah, I think there are as many men who are afraid to say, I want a relationship. Yeah, yeah. And I think, think, I think you, you can know. have completely healthy hookup relationships where a woman gets what she needs because that's what she needs at the given time, but her what she needs might change later on. So and then unfortunately, it sometimes biologically changes yes. because of the biological changes that happen. Either she's starting to feel bonded because of the... It, as I interviewed so many people for this book, and some of them said, here's the thing about hookups. It always starts out fine until somebody gets hurt because eventually one person likes the other person more. Yeah, and I mean, that's, I think, when maybe you're not being honest to yourself about how your utility function has changed. Yeah, the first or, person to be honest with is yourself. Yeah, yeah. So um, I think it would be really cool if, I mean, how you build the base of economic thing, if you extrapolate out to how um, like people's functions can be different and how they change over a lifetime and how what you look for is different, and that might lead Absolutely. to serial monogamy and that kind the of thing. The two times where uh, men and women need each other the most are when they are raising offspring who are very small children, you know, the, the 0 to 10 or 0 to 12, and uh, my age, as we get older, and we're looking for companionship to settle down with as uh, health problems start to happen. Thank you. Thanks. Any other questions? What effect do you think STDs had in early human sexual development? Well, I'm only guessing, but I would say that in the early sexual development, STDs because, again, it's a small populations of people. So if they came like any other disease, if they came through, they wiped out a group. Remember, at one point, there were 27 humanoid species living together and some of them mixing and mating even. So that's even separate from the other four primate species. So plenty of them got knocked out along the way as we zeroed down into one. And STDs were one way. Lots of other diseases, too. So how did that So you're thinking it might have most knocked out the people who were the most promiscuous. Is that your guess? I don't know. Guess? That's true, maybe. I don't know. Does that sound like it could have been? I think that if we stayed too 100% monogamous, although, you know, 
there are plenty of species that are 100% monogamous, and they tend to procreate and do just fine. But I think what was important for humans is that we had the 3%er who wandered. Um, so that we could mix up the gene pool as much as possible. We know about, you know about the Swiss t-shirt study, right? The, the smelling pheromones. Okay, so um, the Swiss t-shirt study is where they put uh, a bunch of men and asked them to sleep in the same, t they each had their own uh, t-shirt every night for 14 <laughs> nights. And then uh, they put it in a Ziploc bag every morning to lock in the freshness. And at the end of a couple of weeks, they had a panel of women just smell the t-shirts. And what they found is the pheromones that the women found most attractive were those that had the most disparate immune systems. Because when you mate with somebody, you take uh, one gene from another and another from another, so that you've got blue eyes from one and long legs from another and brown hair from another, et cetera, except immune systems. They combine. So we can actually sniff out when people have immune systems that are too similar to us. That's why our brothers smell so nasty to us. We, they, honestly, they do. I remember growing up thinking, guys, take a shower. Um, but I didn't notice it with other guys. So. Um, the, and what was I else I going to say about STDs? So in the same sense, I think along the way, people have been using all kinds of ways to attract mates, separate and aside from just visual. Visual is a big one for men. Um, and women most vote for intelligence and kindness over looks, by the way, you guys. So don't worry about your hair. Worry about how funny you are. Um, because it's connected to intelligence, too. Um, you have funny hair. Are you going to have funny hair? That would be great. <laughs> anyway, uh, any other questions? You said that um, a lot of the stuff that you say is not um, politically correct, just probably like the understatement of. <laughs> um, do, do you have like uh, the the women's uh, yeah. the women's studies department like parked out from you know across your office with torches and? You know the true feminists understand that true feminine female sexual freedom is to have choice. And I don't actually say there's one way, one right way to do anything. I can give you statistical probabilities. I can tell you a little bit about your biology. By the way, the more sexual partners a man has had, the more likely he is to perceive diminished attractiveness in each new mate. So it's a race to the bottom for him. Every new woman rolls over easy, it disappoints him. This is a big study out of UCLA. The more sexual partners a woman has had, the more likely she is to be on an antidepressant. Now, could be working in reverse. Depressed women could be using sex to self-medicate. We don't necessarily assume causality there. But we look at all this, and we look at the picture of what's going on, and we listen to our own bodies, our own souls, and we ask for what nutrition's out there. You know, I wrote a blog a couple, and you're all oh, welcome to subscribe to my blog. Mm -hmm. I sent out a weekly newsletter. Um, or your YouTube channel. My YouTube channel, of course. Um, I wrote a blog about how I really have this new enlightened thinking that the uh, Muslim hijab is actually a great act of female sexual freedom. And uh, because I spent a month in London, I talked to a lot of Muslim women, and you know, they were saying these young, hot girls working at Starbucks with their hijab, and, and, I, and I would ask them, I would just talk to them about who they were, and very modern, and, and they said, uh, listen, you guys think you've got female sexual freedom, and you are doing Brazilian waxes, vajazzling, bleaching your anus, all to please men, and the porn industry? Like, that's female sexual freedom? And I looked at them and I thought, you know what? This whole idea of choosing to be modest, nothing put on them. Nobody says in the streets of, on Oxford Street, you've got to wear a hijab, right? So it, the choice to be modest is power, it's female power. And so when I talked to some of the, and, and there was a feminist who I quoted in my blog who said, you know, the, you know bearing your breasts on YouTube isn't necessarily female power, neither is wearing a hijab. What's female power is being able to have the choice, and that's freedom to understand all the various choices available to you. Anyway, my, my, so so you, you, you answered the question of um, why are, is that feminists should not be angry at you? <laughs> oh, but are some of them angry? I, 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 is there, I, I, I you think you're politically incorrect. I think you, I, I, from a woman's yeah. standpoint, yeah. Yeah. spot on. I think, I, I think teaching women to understand their biology and respect it and empower them to live out their biology is good. Um, I do have a few women, uh, you know, usually the undergraduates, at the university level who are very <laughs> pro they'll walk out the back. I watch them go, <coughs> close their books and walk out. Uh, so, and then there'll be a few that'll stay later for the chit chat who'll be like, so I've been hooking up with this guy for a while. I thought he was my boyfriend and I just saw on Facebook that my friend slept with him. And, you know, so <laughs> I'm like, 
did you ever have a talk with him about exclusivity? <laughs> so it's just a matter of you know being authentic with ourselves and our feelings and being able to talk to people. You know, I know you guys are in the tech business and it's all about t -t 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 now, but I do say that when you have a relationship with somebody by text, whether it's business, whatever relationship, it's like listening to your favorite band without the drummer or the lead singer. So you're missing a lot. When we communicate, we have visual, we have body language, we got vocal tone, you're smelling me, we got pheromones. Your brain is taking in so much information right now. But when you're t -t 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 -t, you're actually uh, putting yourself on. That's why people fall into catfishes, because they are projecting their own needs, loves, and desires onto the computer. And they get just enough back that they think it's real. Can you talk a little bit more about, um, you were saying you know, women are Well, so okay. Socially, we change. Biologically, we have a change. Well, he, all the women who are graduating ahead of men. I mean, you know, we go for our careers, and then. I know exactly what you're saying. Okay, right, right now, there's a book you have to read that I love called. Uh, Re reshaping the work family debate why men and social class matter. It's by Joan up at UC Hastings uh, Law School. Okay, she wrote this amazing book saying. You know, our problem is, you know, right now we are not preparing women for motherhood. We have failed them. In our push to push girls forward and push girls into higher education, I have a high school age girl. In ninth grade, they sent them out a college application, told the kids to fill it out, look where the holes, and start filling them in in the next three years. My kid is 15 years old. She has no interest in going to hang out in the mall and pick out boys. She wants to go tour colleges on every vacation we take. I'm like, you gotta stop. You gotta have fun. You gotta be a teenager. It's, Right, they're pushing these girls, pushing these girls like crazy. She's all concerned about her GPA, and she's crying in the bathtub if it's not 4.0, and I'm like, stop. And boys too. Go smoke some weed and meet a boy. I mean, yeah, exactly. But in particular, uh, honestly, I never thought as a mother that I'd be thinking that to my daughter. Like, I didn't say it, thinking it. <laughs> um, I've also said to my daughter, listen, uh, if you have, I know you watch Teen Mom on MTV, and by the way, my friend Jared at the back produced a lot of, and, and, uh, Jared and, and Jordan, the two J's, uh, produce for MTV. They do the VMAs, and, and they produce Teen Mom. And I was like, listen to my daughter. If you watch Teen Mom and you have a teenage pregnancy, you know you are so going to be grounded. And I'm so going to take that baby. Because I'm afraid I, the whole problem here is I'm not going to get to be a grandmother. That's really what it's about, OK? Um, so the answer is, if you look at countries, more developed countries like us, like Sweden and Iceland, they're very powerful women. They have more babies born out of wedlock. Uh, but what they have are the social supports that we don't have here. The problem is this. The single mother walk, we don't have the social supports advanced enough. So the single mother walk is a hard one. I'm in it. I've been single for eight years. I got two kids. Let me tell you, single mothers in America today have their own worse mental health, worse physical health. Their kids have worse physical health. Their kids have lower academic grades, earlier onset of sexual behavior, and more uh, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, basically. Okay? It, we do not have any social support. So when I see uh, the government trying to push this whole bill to provide preschools, at least as some child care, you know, 14 million single mothers are raising one in four American children right now. One in four. And it's only going up because women are not choosing marriage or men are not choosing marriage or they, you know, their children have divorced themselves. We're a second generation now of divorced people who are terrified of it. So um, the answer is a very complicated one that has to not only involve personal decision, not only in how we raise our girls, but also looking at our culture as a whole and what we can do to support single parent families, whether it be a man or a woman raising the kids. It's tough. I mean, yeah. you know, you're asking women to basically look to try and have babies at you know, 25, 26, 27, 28. Look for men who are ready, who are genetically good. Interesting good. enough, research shows that a girl who has a baby during college or right after college takes less of a financial hit than if she takes a big time off at 35. Because she's not making much then. And she can hop back, because she's young enough to hop back on the treadmill. When you're 35 and you're making $250,000 a year and you take two years off to stay with that baby, right? It's a whole different thing. So, um, and you're, you're also your, your commitments, I mean, you're, you're, you're paying a how much higher mortgage at that point. Everything, yeah. You're, you're it's so much harder, exactly. But then coming back into it, the I'll tell you, one of the changes we can make right away, everybody in this culture, stop using the word maternity leave. It's paternal leave, it's paternity leave. Or, sorry, it's, it's parental leave, sorry. As soon as we call it parental leave, and men get into the game, 
and think they have equal access to these benefits, then. Yeah. But no, but, but not for, what about the guy who wants to stay home and take care of the kids? And what if she wants to charge back? Until it becomes gender equal, until the care of children becomes gender equal and it's instituted at the corporate level, then that's what happened in, I'm Canadian, so in Canada you get a year off father or mother paid at 80% of your salary. Because they have socialized medicine and they've learned that if you breastfeed those babies, you reduce your health care costs by so much. I know, but that makes sense. You see. Yeah. So that's, There's a that's number. That makes sense. So yeah. 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 You're trying to make sense. Oh, of course. We don't want to make sense. Oh. So, OK. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> yeah. I just don't see Americans up there. I mean, drug companies, a lot of I, I understand what you're saying. But you guys have the power. You're our future. You're young Americans who have a voice, who are out there. On <laughs> okay, I got a peer over here. I'm still older than you, I promise. <laughs> so, uh, I would bet. How old are you? 51. Oh, we're peers. I'm 51 too. <laughs> we'll hook up later. Okay. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Dr. Walsh, thank All right. you so much thank for you. being Go here to today. Good for you. And guys, if you want your book signed, we have some Sharpies in the back. Oh, yeah. Um, I think we might have run out of books. But thank you guys so much for coming. Do I get a Thanks Google so t-shirt? Do I get a Google t-shirt?